Good afternoon. Welcome back to Tort Liability and Risk Management. This is Victoria Beal with the Ohio LTAP Center, and I'm very pleased to have with us again today my colleague, Dr. Ron Eck from the West Virginia LTAP Center, and he is going to be your presenter for today's session. We have in the handout box the same two handouts that we had in there last week, but if this is your first time participating in a session with us, then please make sure you download those. I will also be sending them out as follow-up links after the webinar. Um, and I also ask, and a few of you are doing this already, I appreciate it, please drop me a higher hello in the question box so we can make sure you know where it's at and that it's working for you. Um, we want to make certain that questions are sent in through the question box, such as the one we got just a few minutes before we started, and I had already shared that with Ron, so I don't know if he'll want to address that one right off the bat or not. Um, I can go ahead and read it now, Ron, if you want me to. Sure, if you want to. Sure. It says, can an agency's duty to provide a safe street be delegated to an outside entity, such as a design-build contractor or project manager? So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Ron. Thanks, Victoria. Welcome, everyone, to day three. Uh, excellent question. And I would say, uh, for one thing, probably all those parties that were identified, if they were involved, they would probably be named in a suit, at least initially. Uh, and I would say in certain instances, yes. For example, uh, Maybe if a agency or toll road some, or something leases the road, toll agency maybe leases the roadway to a private entity or something, yes. Or I know in some states, the uh, if there's a construction contract to do some work, say, on, on an interstate or other roadway, that uh, roadway may be the response responsibility of the contractor during the project and they agree to hold say the state DOT harmless uh, but that again that would be part of the of the contract uh, one thing and I know this is a tort class maybe I shouldn't take time to get into it but an issue that sometimes comes up say regarding sidewalks and the Americans with Disabilities Act is can a public agency if a sidewalk is not accessible in front of or say along a, a block or something in a neighborhood can the municipality point to the property owners and say by you know by ordinance they're supposed to be maintaining the sidewalks uh, and i don't know all the legalities and technicalities of that but my sense is in talking to attorneys who are involved in those sorts of civil again this is civil rights law ada that uh, it really, in that case, it would be the municipality that would be ultimately responsible for making sure those sidewalks are accessible. So good question, and actually, I guess it can get somewhat complex. We have another couple other questions from last time. If you'll allow me, we'll do those here at the start before we get into the uh, day three materials. One question is, have any employees within a DOT dispatch center been subpoenaed to appear in court. In some centers, that is where the initial call begins. That's a good question as well. And yeah, you're absolutely, whoever made that comment or question is absolutely right. That oftentimes that is where the initial call or notice, if you will, comes in. I'm sure probably some folks from dispatch centers have been subpoenaed to testify at trial. I don't know that I've run into that in my experience, but that's maybe because I don't typically, I don't know that I ever have sat through an entire trial. I just you know, appear, wait, maybe wait briefly and then testify and then I leave. But in my experience, I am aware that uh, dispatch center personnel have been subpoenaed to give depositions. Maybe I should back up a minute. Uh, in my experience, one of the first things that a plaintiff's attorney will uh, include in their interrogatories, if you remember that from last time, that's sort of the written uh, request for written in, or written request for information, and also the production of documents, various documents that the agency has, especially if it's sort of a drainage case or a snow and ice related case. One of the first things that a plaintiff's attorney will request are the 
dispatch logs or radio logs, whatever you call them in your agency. And it would not be unusual after those would be produced by the uh, roadway agency, the plaintiff's attorney may subpoena someone from the dispatch center to, if nothing else, sort of explain to him or her how to interpret or you know, how to understand these records and what the procedures and protocols are within the, the center in terms of communications and so forth. So short answer would be yes, it is, it, it is possible. In fact, not unusual that personnel in a dispatch center may have to uh, give deposition testimony. And then our next question, the third question, the final one here is a little bit longer, but let me read everything so you have the full context. This person says, we have a location where we have a severe roadway drop-off close to the roadway, and it warrants guardrail. However, the roadside does not allow for guardrail to be installed that would meet standards. The face of the slope is rock, and the embankment doesn't stay on it for very long. Ideally, the roadway would be moved over a few feet to allow for guardrail to be installed. However, that long-term fix is a long way off if it ever happens. Have there been any cases that can be reviewed for guidance on leaving a drop-off that warrants guardrail unshielded versus putting in a substandard guardrail installation? Very interesting question, and I'll just share with you my thoughts. Maybe other engineers might have different opinions or agencies may have different ways of handling that. But uh, my thought would be it's probably not a good idea to put in a substandard guardrail installation. Unless, and if you did, I would certainly take care to document. In fact, I would document this, the entire situation here as this person has outlined it in their question. What I would look at maybe is are there ways, you know, sort of there's a couple ways to teach or to cover or to handle uh, these roadway departure cases. One is to to use barriers or to shield motorists to prevent them from going off the road or striking a fixed object or something. But another approach, which some would argue maybe is an approach we should use first, is to use techniques that help keep motorists on the roadway. And so I would maybe say here, think about can you do things like maybe uh, an edge line rumble strip or rumble stripe or or a double wide white edge line. I, I'm assuming there's an edge line on the road or maybe recessed pavement markers along the edge line. You may not normally do that in your practice, but my point would be do something to sort of highlight the edge of the roadway or even could you attach say some flexible uh, delineator pylons or posts to, to the rock even to kind of create a, a uh, view for motorists of, you know, of the edge of the roadway. So even though you, maybe it's not for whatever reason possible to put in the, the barrier, can you do things to help keep motorists on the roadway? And again, I, I would document all of that. So good questions, keep them coming today if, if you have them that occur to you. And uh, we're in day three. Today, we're going to shift gears a little bit and focus on risk management. We've talked in the past two days about tort liability and the tort claims process. Today, we will focus on risk management. And also, hopefully, we'll have time for some uh, to start into the case studies of some actual tort claims. This risk management will focus both on risk management for the organization, but also for individuals. Remember, we talked last time, I believe, that in some cases, individuals may be named in a, a lawsuit. So you want to keep these risk management kind of tips in mind because you certainly uh, hopefully would not be named. But if you are named in a lawsuit, some of these things, doing some of these things, I think will help you defend yourself in the matter. The risk management objectives, you can see here, uh, I, 
I'd say the main objective is to make roadways safer. If we can reduce crashes, by definition, there'll be fewer lawsuits. If fewer people are severely injured and killed, there'll be fewer lawsuits. So I like to think of this as sort of a roadway safety type of, of class. But also these things we'll talk about are the objectives of risk management would be to reduce the potential exposure to liability, meaning the number of suits or claims that are filed. But let's face it, we do live in a litigious society. That is sort of part of uh, what happens in our society here, the lawsuits are filed. So if when suits are filed, what can we do to help better defend the suits that do come in, or maybe some some suits perhaps should be settled or resolved early on, uh, maybe to avoid the possibility of a, of a huge verdict, for example. So these are the objectives of risk management. Uh, some of the principles of risk management, uh, you can see here the, the various principles that a risk manager would uh, work with or use as part of their day-to-day -day activities, but notice the first one is identify the risk and then try to measure or forecast that and then develop a plan to reduce or control that risk. In our case, I would argue the risk is primarily fatal and serious or permanent injury types of crashes, because that's really where the risk exposure, the liability risk exposure comes from. Uh, sometimes people do file lawsuits over person or over, I should say, property damage crashes, but in general, it's the fatal and serious injury crashes. Uh, in fact, I think many, at least larger size agencies, you all probably have some procedure for handling what I would call the nuisance type of claims that don't rise to the level of a, a lawsuit. For example, those of you in northern climates are probably familiar with maybe uh, bracing materials being applied to the roadway for snow removal and ice control, and maybe one of those chips of stone or whatever uh, cracks somebody's windshield, and they may file a claim seeking reimbursement to get their their windshield repaired or replaced. Or you know, this time of year in the summertime, agencies may be putting down lane lines and pavement markings of various types. And maybe you get claims from somebody with claiming their new pickup truck or something now has some white or yellow paint on it because they came close to the, the uh, striping operation. So those I would call kind of nuisance types of claims. And as I said, I think most agencies probably have some sort of administrative procedure or way of, of dealing that, dealing with that. Or even, you know, in this part of the country where I am, Another one in the winter time is uh, nail boxes that are taken out by plow trucks. And again, those those are property damage sort of issues, but typically don't rise to the level of a, a lawsuit. Uh, having said that though, I can remember a few years ago, I was involved in a case in the one of the Gulf Coast states where a one of these big mobile cranes was being transported on a low boy tractor semi-trailer rig and as often happens the rig high center got stuck on the railroad crossing and the driver try as he might he was not able to free the rig fortunately the driver was out of the rig uh, and actually calling the railroad the 800 number 1-800 emergency notification number to try to stop the train but it was too late the train hit the crane and fortunately, no one was injured. The train crew, I guess, hit the floor of their locomotive and the driver of the truck was safely out of the truck. But 23 rail car loads of brand new automobiles were basically destroyed in the crash. And in that case, the railroad sued the trucking company and the driver seeking compensation for however many hundred or more new cars you know, were, were destroyed or totaled in that crash. So there are cases where property damage can be significant, but in most cases, it's the fatal and serious injury crashes we're concerned about. What 
influences liability or what causes liability to increase? Well, things like perceived road defects, where the more defects one can see or perceive on the roadway, generally there's an increase in liability. Changed operational conditions, for example, work zones. Maybe the road surface has been milled, or maybe there's a shift in the travel path, or maybe the travel lanes are narrowed compared to what they were originally. All these changed operational conditions uh, tend to increase liability. But it doesn't have to be a work zone. It could be anywhere where operating conditions change. For example, going from one roadway design criteria, maybe with a shoulder, wide lanes, edge lines, and then sort of instantaneously at the state line or city limit or county line, the roadway downstream of that maybe has no shoulder and no edge line and the lanes are narrower. Those are locations where generally there'll be higher crash experience, but also probably an increase in liability. And of course, increased crash severity generally means an increase in liability. And interestingly, and I may have mentioned this in one of the two previous classes, generally liability increases with the number of defendants. And what a plaintiff often hopes will happen, and rightly or wrongly does happen quite a bit, is that the defendants will start pointing fingers at one another rather than sort of working together as a, a team to defend the case. They'll argue amongst themselves. And oftentimes that works to the plaintiff's benefit. What does the public expect? Thinking now in terms of, say, members of the public who might make up a jury in a roadway case. Well, they expect the road agency will, you know, fulfill its duty, will act responsibly in terms of carrying out its mission and its duties in a reasonable manner. There's that word reasonable again, and this is going to vary from case to case, but it's up to the to me, it's up to the road agency when they're presenting their case, say at trial, to educate the jury, to show them that, show the jury that in fact the agency did operate in a reasonable manner, consistent with its practices and procedures and so forth. Based on the information at hand, and that information at hand should be relatively current, the road should have been inspected relatively recently. It's going to, how recently, probably depend on the, the functional class of the roadway and traffic volume and those sorts of things. But based on the information at hand and with the available resources. And I think with that available resources, the courts recognize that agencies don't have unlimited budgets, unlimited funds, but they expect those funds to be expended in an objective, rational manner. And so to me, that's part of that educating the jury as well. Show, show the jury, explain to the jury how we're using those resources in an objective and rational manner. What about reasonableness of action? These are the things that go into to judging reasonableness. What's the severity of the harm posed by the condition? What's the severity? Also, what is the likelihood of harm to the public or kind of the probability of harm, if you will? What method or methods are available to remediate the situation? What's the burden of removing the condition in terms of is there something that can be kind of a quick fix or does it take something more longer term, more expensive, like the uh, condition that was mentioned in the question about the guardrail a few minutes ago. It sounded like from that condition that it was the burden of removing that condition is really pretty high. The significant cost, uh, maybe, maybe right-of-way purchase, uh, construction costs, they preclude immediately correcting that or removing that condition. It's going to take some time to, to program that for improvement as opposed to something where maybe just putting up a warning sign or maybe restriping the roadway or something 
may remove the condition or, or remediate the problem. And then what about the feasibility or applicability of temporary protective measures? Maybe something to delineate a feature or putting some channelization around a feature, something like that. What about what temporary measures, temporary protective measures might apply? Let's look at some risk management activities that an agency might be involved with. One is just review of policies and manuals. And maybe agencies do this, hopefully they do it on a regular basis. But what I'm talking about here is maybe not just having one person review the, the policy or the manual to see if they need to be updated. But as a slide says, a systematic review by attorneys, maybe the risk management staff, engineers, if it relates to construction and maintenance, have some maintenance and construction personnel, part of that uh, team, if you will, that reviews the policies and manuals with an eye toward, are there things that we're saying in here that in these policies or manuals that might increase our risk exposure? Or could something be phrased in a different way or stated differently to try to reduce the risk exposure. So reviewing policies and manuals, I think is especially do that on a periodic basis is a good practice. And as I said, by, have a team look at it, not just one person or one unit within the organization, but have a variety of different eyes or different perspectives look at it. Another issue that comes up quite a bit, uh, not only in say design, or construction, but also in the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, is variation from agency guidelines. Uh, many agencies may call them design exceptions. Or in ADA, a term you may have heard is they're sometimes called uh, technical infeasibilities, where it's technically infeasible to comply with the ADA criteria. To me, a key part of Handling this from a risk management standpoint is documentation. Documentation is critical. Uh, in my work, I mentioned that I do forensic engineering work, and I have the luxury, if I'm called into a particular matter, it's always after the fact, and I have the benefit of hindsight, which of course is always 2020. And I can review the discovery materials, and I can review the deposition testimony. And oftentimes I can see that maybe where an agency deviated from its design standards or from the AASHTO Green Book standards, I can see in hindsight why they did that. And there was more often than not, well, more often than not, there's a good reason why they did it. But if you look in the file, in the documentation, there's really no documentation to support that, of why they did it what they did. And so it's easy for a plaintiff's attorney to make the case, you know, this was just one person's sort of arbitrary way of handling this, and they didn't get any input from anybody else in the organization. They just went ahead and did it. Well, having some documentation or a procedure for handling these variations from agency guidelines, I think can go a long way to counter that sort of a claim by a plaintiff's attorney. So here are just some of the basics. Show in your documentation that you were aware of the guideline or the standard and that you considered it. If you allow me to use, say, an ADA example, like a sidewalk, maybe for whatever reason, you can't get a 2% cross slope on your sidewalk, but at least show in your documentation that you're aware of what the ADA criteria call for and then give the reason for, maybe in this case, yours had to be 3% because of drainage or utilities or historic structure or something like that. So give the reason for the variation. And then a key thing is it's approval by competent authority. And here's an example. I know you can't read all the details and that's not important, but this, get my pointer here. This is a sample of the first page of Caltrans, the California DOT, their template for 
documenting exceptions to mandatory design standards. So this is their template that they have. And notice the first page, which I pasted here, is nothing but signatures. And that may look kind of bureaucratic, but actually there's a good reason for that. Notice the point is you want to show that this deviation or this exception to the design standard or variation from the standard was reviewed and approved by multiple people in the organization at different levels. So it was not just one person's, as the plaintiff's attorneys like to say, arbitrary and capricious decision. No, it, it, was, it may have originated with the design engineer, but it was reviewed and approved at various levels in the agency. And so that, that is important, as I mentioned. And here's some other key sections in that Caltrans template. You have a section of documentation that describes the proposed project and the non-standard features of it. Why are, or why is a, an exception being requested? What's the added cost if you're going to comply with the standard or what would have to be done? You know, maybe in say Americans with Disabilities Act case, uh, maybe you all have run into this uh, issue that comes up a lot around the country, especially here in the East where we have older infrastructure, is the agency may want to lower one edge of the sidewalk, say the building edge of the sidewalk to comply with the 2% cross slope. But when you think about doing that, it turns out that under the sidewalk, under a part of the sidewalk, are basements of those buildings. And so if you lower the sidewalk, you're basically making that basement useless, which may affect the, you know, the use of the building itself. So you may actually have to purchase a building just to be able to get a 2% cross slope. And that would be in my opinion, a valid reason for making a claim of technical infeasibility. It's technically infeasible to get a 2% cross slope. But getting back to the, the roadway cases, you know, make sure you have traffic data, crash data, maybe crash analysis, crash summaries, relevant statistics, and then plenty of attachments. Draw, they could be engineering drawings, construction drawings. They could just be sketches. Photographs, you know, these days photographs are easy to include in, in these files, plus any relevant correspondence. So documentation is critical when you're making these claims for a design exception or a technical infeasibility. Another risk management activity, and this probably applies more to smaller agencies, but that is review your documentation procedures in terms of how do you get notice of an issue? Is it a resident or someone calls in or do they send a letter or do they send an email? But how, how does that information come in and how is it responded to? And I realize most larger agencies have a well-developed procedure for handling this, for getting input, whether it's online or from a letter or a phone call and then making sure somebody goes out to uh, investigate the situation. But again, as I said, not all small agencies have that, but to me, everybody needs to have, any agency of any size needs to have a procedure for handling this information that comes in and then being able to respond to it in a timely manner. And then of course, a key part of that is documenting what you did and why, why you did it. As you all know, sometimes what happens, and I don't mean to minimize the public's concern, but sometimes a member of the public might, or a citizen might call in or email in with a concern. And when you or someone working for you goes out to investigate it, it's really not the issue maybe that you thought it was or as serious as the citizen thinks it is. And so maybe you decide not, not to do anything. If that's what you decide, that may be fine, but make sure you document that you did go out there, you investigated it, but that uh, you know, based on your professional judgment, you don't see an issue and so you're not gonna recommend doing anything at this time because that can that's also important, especially if someone calls in maybe you know, sort of on a regular basis. I've seen it in court. The, 
the if there is a crash or some sort of incident, the uh, plaintiff will probably identify that person, that citizen, from the call records or from emails or whatever, and use them as a witness in the uh, case if it goes to trial. And then that person's on the witness stand saying, I called these folks many times and they never did anything. But at least then if you have records to show that, yeah, we responded each time this person called, but for this reason and that reason, we didn't feel that this justified any action, that can go a long way in helping you defend, defend a matter. Another important risk management activity, I think, is developing and maintaining personnel competence. And this is something I think I noted last time that I think my sense is this has changed over the last few decades. You recall that complaint I shared with you. One of the allegations of the plaintiff was that the DOT did not train its employees. So training is something that plaintiff's attorneys are very well aware of. It's also part of being a reasonable public works agency. And I think Victoria mentioned too, in response to one of the questions that ODOT or, or some of the local agencies, one of the requests for production of documents that they sometimes get relates to training materials that employees have used as part of their, their training. So this personal comp, personnel competence and training is critical. So here's my list of some of the things that I think go into personnel competence. And make sure that, to me, really every employee in your agency should receive training on a regular basis. Obviously, not everybody's going to have the same training. It's going to depend on their uh, what they do for their their job. But uh, everybody should have training appropriate to their job assignment, including, especially for field folks, there should be that safety training should be part of that as well. Uh, again, notice here I'm saying as part of personnel competence. And as part of kind of your personal risk management, document design and other decisions. That's, that's part of this whole personnel competence. Conduct post-construction reviews. That kind of sounds kind of formal, but I don't mean it that way. I mean it really in the broadest sense. I mean, when you do finish construction of a project, there should be a post-construction review, a walkthrough or a drive-through. That's appropriate and, in my opinion, necessary as part of this personnel competence. But it could also be as simple as maybe a crew is out uh, installing signs or replacing signs near an intersection. To me, what would be a good idea before they leave the area, after they've installed the signs, have that crew drive through the roadway past those signs. Because as we all know, Signs could be in compliance with the MUTCD, everything could be proper, but depending on the background conditions or maybe the foreground conditions, those signs may not be as conspicuous as we'd like them to be. So that kind of post construction review maybe allows us, maybe we need to adjust the location of the signs a little bit to make them more conspicuous. It could also mean, if you recall last time, I showed you a picture of a sharp pressed curve that had a serious sight line restriction. And there were a lot of locked wheel tire marks just before that crest. I called that reading the road. To me, that's also part of this review process. If you see fewer members of your staff see something like that out on the roadway, and it, could be skid marks like we're in the photo I showed you, but it could be gouge marks in the pavement. It could be yaw marks where you know, drivers leave the road and then yaw across the roadway. It could be sections of guardrail that always seem to be shiny and new because they're being replaced on a regular basis. If you see those sorts of things, try to look at that and see what's the underlying cause or reason why motorists may be having difficulty with that section of road. Like if the guardrail panels are always being replaced, 
rather than just keep replacing the guardrail, take a look at the roadway. Is there something with the roadway? Maybe the curve is not delineated as well as it might be, or maybe there's slippery pavement, or maybe the super elevation is deficient or something like that, and try to address the underlying cause rather than just the symptoms. And also in terms of work zone traffic control, you know, make sure it's effective. Again, drive through or the, of course with work zones, depending on the, the road and the volume and the speed, higher volume roads, we probably need to be making multiple inspections per day to check that the traffic control devices are in place. Or even, I also teach, in fact, I taught it here for, couple months ago, I believe, a class in uh, ADA in work zones. And there I argue that something else we should be doing now, both from a safety and from a ADA standpoint, is we probably should be walking through pedestrian work zones on sidewalks to make sure they're accessible and detectable to folks in wheelchairs and individuals with vision impairments. So not only roadway work zones, but also sidewalk work zones. So here is my, I call it a risk management checklist. I've put this together, it's kind of expanded over the years, but this is based on my experience, based on talking with other individuals, based on some research that I've done. And it's just some things that I think if individuals and agencies try to follow something like this list, it will help them manage their risk, if nothing else, help them better defend suits that might be filed. Now, one thing on some of these, you might say, Ron, why are you even telling us that? That's kind of obvious. And I will agree, many of these are probably obvious, but unfortunately, it's the sort of things that uh, I see frequently may not be done, and that's when agencies get into trouble. Like the first one on the list, that seems sort of obvious, right? Clearly defined duties and authorities and responsibilities of employees. Sounds like a no-brainer, but the few times I have been in the courtroom, maybe waiting to testify, and a road agency personnel person has been on the witness stand, I hear them say something like, in response to cross-examination, they'll say, gee, I didn't know I was supposed to do that. But think about that. Not only does it make that look individual look bad, but it also kind of makes the whole agency look bad. So make sure everybody understands what their duties and authorities are. Maintain adequate facility records so that you can show when you did something, maybe who was involved, what materials were used, what equipment was used. If it's a work zone sort of thing, make sure you have adequate uh, you know, field inspector diaries and other documentation. Number three, provide an inspection system. Sometimes when I say that, if I'm teaching this class in person, I see people's eyes roll and they're thinking, well, he's making us do more paperwork. I'm not really talking about a written inspection system. I mean, you can do that, certainly. But this is just, what I'm saying here is really a way, a system to make sure that every road in your jurisdiction or in your network is inspected by a knowledgeable person on some regular basis. And that regular basis is going to depend on the roadway. Uh, a high volume interstate roadway in or outside of a large metropolitan area, given the speed and volume, that roadway probably is inspected multiple times a day. And that's appropriate. On the other hand, if you think out in a rural I'm thinking of a rural county, say here in West Virginia, just forest basically, very few people per mile. I'm thinking of a gravel road that may carry 20 vehicles a day. That vehicle does, or that roadway doesn't need to be inspected on a daily basis. Maybe you know, once a month or a couple times a month or after a, a major storm event. So the inspection will vary with the uh, roadway itself. But again, every road in your system should be inspected on a regular basis. Sometimes when I've taught this class 
in person in the past, I used to show a uh, video of a mock trial. It was not an actual trial, it was a mock trial at a hotel, but the the person on the witness stand was a county road supervisor from Montana, and he's being cross-examined in a case involving a fatal crash on one of his roads. And he's asked about the last time he traveled on this road where the fatal crash occurred. And I think it had been like three or four years. And so the plaintiff's attorney is further questioning and says, well, what about, you're saying there's some roads in your county that you don't travel on for four or five years? And then his, in his Montana uh, twang, he says something like, well, there's just some roads there ain't no reason to be on. Well, think about that. If you own a public roadway system, hopefully you're not saying that about one of your roadways. You, you need to be out inspecting your roadways on a regular basis, even if they have a very low traffic volume. Number four, maybe number four here should be number one on the list. Document, document, document. As the slide says, good documentation wins. So let's look at that a little bit more. This is my list of the characteristics of good personal documentation for, for you yourself as a roadway professional. And notice it's not, very, what are there, five bullet points there. The first one is it should be prepared in a timely manner, meaning when you tell someone to do something or when you do something or when you order something, document it at that time. Don't say, well, I'm, you know, I'll do all this at the end of the day or the end of the week. That's not a good practice. Just be contemporaneous about it. When you do something or say something or give somebody instructions, document it at that time. It should be complete. And that I don't mean that to be intimidating. It doesn't have to be perfect grammar and you know, perfect sentences. Just something that you or someone else, maybe a few years from now, if there's a lawsuit filed, are able to realize what you did or what you told someone to do. Like it could be you know, told, told Kevin to play stop sign, something like that. It doesn't have to be complete sentences or good grammar, as long as someone can understand what you said or what you did. And then notice it should be dated and signed and maybe most important of all, filed in a manner facilitating retrieval. Meaning in a couple years, maybe if there's a crash and then a lawsuit at a particular involving a particular location and there'd be a request for production of documents, you're able to locate that note or that documentation and produce it as part of that response to the plaintiff's attorney or to one of the other parties in the lawsuit. Maybe some of you remember, and I'm old enough that I remember when I started teaching at West Virginia University, this was, we didn't have computers really, we, there was no public internet, uh, in fact there wasn't even voicemail, we had a staff of maybe half a dozen receptionists they were called, and if someone would call, say me at the university as a professor, and maybe I was teaching a class, a call would come in and this person would take the call, take the message, and uh, they would leave, maybe some of you have seen them, I guess they're obsolete now, but they were these little pink slips, maybe what, four by four or three and a half by three and a half inches. And it said, while you were out at the top, and then there was a blank where the receptionist could type right in who called and their phone number. And then there was a little bit of space to leave a message, like please call him about this or that. Uh, what I've done and I've, in the past and I've seen other people do, was you, know, you probably have that uh, slip in your hand, that pink while you were out slip in your hand while you're returning a call. And I would just make some notes on there, depending what the call involved. And those, if those met this criteria here, if I took the notes or said I was going to do something at the time I was in the call and I dated and signed it and filed it, that would meet these requirements of good personal documentation. So the point is, it does not have to be on agency letterhead or word processed or what have you. As long as it meets these requirements, it is considered good documentation. 
These are some items that constitute reasonable agency documentation. You know, crash, crash history, crash summaries, inventory, like traffic control device inventory, sign inventories. That reasonable agencies have traffic control device inventory so they can manage their sign type and condition. Uh, maintenance records, as I said, of who was on a crew, what did they do that day, replace a culvert or removed an old culvert or, or surface treated so many miles of road, whatever it might be. Work zone matters, field, the field inspector diaries. And then of course the policies and procedures of the agency. Construction drawings, as built drawings, those would be part also of reasonable agency documentation. Number five, establish a citizen response system. I think I talked about that. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned, larger agencies already have this, but this would be some system where the public, residents, citizens can communicate concerns or issues or problems they see, and there should be some system for responding to those concerns. Number six is use current design criteria. Notice the key word there is current. Make sure you're using the current version of various documents. Uh, and again, this may be apply maybe more to more small local, local governments, but I know in some of my LTAP travels, I would visit uh, small local governments to see if we could, LTAP could assist with anything. And uh, if I'd ask someone, about what they were using for signing and marking, it was always good that most everybody was using the MUTCD, but I'd find from time to time that some agencies were not using the current version of the MUTCD, and that can be an issue. So make sure you're using the current version of the various criteria. Follow rational procedures for setting priorities. Recall I said earlier, one of the expectations of the public and of the courts is that agencies use rational objective procedures or systems for setting priorities or for making decisions. If you allow me to use that mock trial video of the Montana County Road Supervisor again, it, it'd be nice to, maybe I should insert that clip here, but he he's asked about what are the maintenance priorities on his roadways. And he says, well, our commissioners live on three of those roads, so they get top priority. Well, what would we call that? That's the political priority system. Uh, I'm not sure that's a rational procedure. If he had said, well, our top priority roads are those with the highest traffic volume, or top priority roads are the school bus routes, or the top priority roads are the roads that serve the regional trauma center, which we have in the county seat. To me, those latter three would all be you know, rational procedures for setting priorities. Ron, we have a question that came in. Sure. It says, how about connected vehicle data now being made available, like road segments with high incidences of harsh braking and near-miss crash data? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think at some point we probably will get to where that sort of regularly collected data, and maybe in some areas it already is. I, I would say nationally we're probably at, not at that level yet, but I, yeah, I could see that being uh, maybe brought up by a plaintiff's attorney. Uh, I don't know how widely that is shared with, uh, say, with uh, municipalities. Do you have any feel for that, Victoria? No, I don't because I, I really don't work in that area, but it is a very good point. And I know that, you know, they pull that type of data from um, a lot of different sources. So I imagine if it's a source outside of your agency that other people could buy it just as well. That's right. That's right. So there's one more, and it's actually more of a comment than a question, but I wanted to read it off. It says, RE point number six, use current design criteria. 
this person said they would add that it's important to note the date that the criteria is being applied, since standards may change over time, and what was current at the time of construction may be out of date when an incident occurs. Yeah, very good point, very good point. Yeah, and sometimes it is. And again, that's something to those of you with the public agencies to keep in mind too, and maybe in helping you defend the case, as I've seen instances where an engineering expert retained by a plaintiff was using, say, the current design criteria, but actually when the roadway was designed or the signing installed, it may have been using or based on the criteria, you know, two two versions previous or something like that. And so that's important to you know catch the the plaintiff with that, if you will, and, and indicate to them that but that was not the criteria that were in place at the time the road, say, was designed or constructed. But very good point. No other questions right now. Okay, thank you. Number eight, I, I sort of talked about a little while ago, I think, and that is to conduct design and operational reviews on a regular basis, learn to read the road. Sometimes you can see a problem that maybe is sort of developing before a crash history starts to occur, and then you can take steps to address whatever that underlying problem might be. So that design and operational reviews is important. Or just as an example, and again, this is more on the civil rights side, not on the tort side, but it would probably apply just as well. I'm aware of a few agencies around the country that on their sidewalk projects, they have, their agency has purchased a, a manual wheelchair, which what, I think they were probably in the order of $150, so not a big expense. And before the agency will sign off on say a streetscape project or some sort of sidewalk project, they will have the appropriate, maybe the construction inspector or whoever actually go through that project on the sidewalk in a wheelchair and they'll actually photograph or videotape that. And if there's any location, say, where the small front wheels of the wheelchair go off the ground such that the stability of the wheelchair might be jeopardized, they will photograph that and they will flag that location and they will not sign off on the project until the uh, sidewalk or the ramps or whatever are accessible. So I, I like to call that sort of an operational review as well. And I think that's a really good practice. Number nine is develop achievable standards of performance. And here the key word is achievable. And again, maybe this applies more to smaller agencies, but make sure that if you have performance standards, which are a good thing, make sure that with your personnel, your equipment, your resources, that you're able to achieve the standards of performance that you've set. Sadly, I've seen some agencies in trying to be good, I guess, public servants, they set their performance standards so high that with their limited resources, they couldn't possibly achieve those, those standards. And so in, in a trial or in, in a legal proceedings, in a tort claim, they end up, the plaintiff's attorney can kind of beat them over the head with their own standards saying, they, this agency can't even meet its own standards. So make sure your standards of performance are achievable given the resources that you're working with. Get good advice. That includes training, includes uh, networking with folks, go to different uh, organizational or professional society meetings, APWA or Institute of Transportation Engineers, NACE, whatever your appropriate agency might, or organization might be, and talk to other folks who maybe are, have faced the same problem you're facing now. Maybe they resolved that a few months ago or a year ago, and maybe have some good ideas they can share with you, or may, you can help other agencies with your experiences. So get good advice, you know, network with folks, interact with folks, share experiences, share solutions. Avoid false economies. A false economy might be an agency or a person that says after a crash occurred, wow, that stop sign was blocked by that those tree limbs, but we better not cut those limbs because that's going to be an admission that we were negligent. 
remember we talked about that i think in the first day that's improvements that you you might make would be called a subsequent remedial measure and generally those cannot be introduced as evidence of failure to to do something or of negligence so if you see a problem after a crash or after an incident you shouldn't hesitate to to fix it or to remediate it uh, number 12 might be the hardest one on the list to, to do and that is get feedback about claims and suits and this is an issue nationally it has been for a number of years uh, in fact a few years ago i remember i was in portland at a meeting of engineers and attorneys to address this issue of how can we improve communication so that the, the folks in the field or the designers can get feedback about claims or lawsuits that are are coming in and for whatever reason it's it i think it's still an issue in fact that was one of the reasons for me putting this course together was to try to introduce some case studies which we'll get to you shortly about actual claims so we can see what sort of lessons we on the public work side can learn from these claims or suits uh, number 13 is cultivate awareness and here i'm talking about maybe awareness within your agency among all employees to report deficiencies or defects they might see for example and i know many crews are out on the road right truck drivers equipment operators uh, involved with maintenance crews, sign installation crews, they're out on the road on a regular basis and they, if they see something, they should say something and report it to the appropriate uh, unit or the appropriate individual. But what I'm saying here is think about those folks that may not be out on the road as part of their jobs every day, like the clerical staff or the mechanics in the shop or the custodial staff. Uh, they might not be out on the road every day, but chances are they drive to work, to and from work every day. And they should be encouraged if they see something amiss on the roadway, like an edge of pavement drop off or an isolated drainage issue, that they should report that to their supervisor. Next one is slightly different, cultivating contacts. Here I'm talking about contacts outside the agency, not within the agency. For example, it could be law enforcement or emergency medical services, or something like that. So cultivating contacts. For example, maybe I remember one time I was talking to an EMS colleague of mine, and he was saying, you know, every time it rains, it seems like we're out here on this curb responding to a car into tree crash. What's going on here? And that got me thinking, you know, well, maybe if they're out on the road, or at least they have the feeling they're out on the road at responding to crashes in this curve every time it rains. Maybe there's something with the pavement surface condition, maybe a polished pavement or bleeding pavement, maybe that should be looked at. So that's the sort of the thing I'm talking about here. Uh, you know, listen to the concerns of these individuals, kind of tell them what we do, what our limitations are, but maybe kind of keep them a supporter make them a supporter and encourage them to keep contact with us so that if they identify or perceive something as an issue or a problem, they'll bring it to our attention to, to check out from the, the roadway standpoint. Number 15, pay attention to your words. And here I'm talking about words, both written and spoken, used in a kind of an official context, whether in-house, in your agency, or in communicating with the, the public. And here on the next slide, I'll come back to this slide here in a minute, but these, this is my short list of some potentially troublesome words in sort of agency communication. Again, either in-house or with the public. And notice here I have a couple acceptable or enough. And we've all probably used these. We all probably heard other people use them. I've heard an engineer say, well, that design is good enough for me. Well, that's the problem with these words is these are subjective. And what's good enough for one of us might not be good enough for the other. Here's another pair of words, safe and unsafe. Uh, 
and this, I, I think the public and maybe the media uh, maybe have a feeling that roads are safe or unsafe. But to me, safety is not a binary thing like it sort of implies here, safe or unsafe. It's not zero, one, or not black or white. To me, safety is a continuum. Some roads are more safe than others. Some roads might be less safe. A road that might be safe today in the middle of summer here in West Virginia might not be so safe in the middle of February if there's a quarter inch of ice from a freezing rainstorm on it. So just keep that in mind if you're using these words safe or unsafe, but probably don't refer to one of your roads as unsafe. Is that Think about it. if there's a lawsuit, the uh, plaintiff's attorney can say, folks, on the jury, you know, this agency called this road or this intersection unsafe. So it kind of gets to notice and uh, also some other issues. Likewise, you know, avoid using the word dangerous or hazardous to describe your roadways. I think there's other ways you can express sort of concern for the roadway without calling it dangerous or hazardous. And then likewise, this word here at the bottom of the list, ensure. Remember, we talked the first day, the duty of a road agency is to provide reasonably safe roads. It's not to ensure the safety of the traveling public. But if an agency says that, for example, in some documentation or something, or in a mission statement, I think an attorney, sharp plaintiff's attorney could construe that, that, hey, this agency is creating a higher duty or a higher standard of care for itself. So be careful in using that word ensure, because remember the duty is to provide a reasonably safe road. So let me go back to this slide again. Uh, investigate certain crashes. I think I gave you an example the first day about that rural agency, small rural agency that investigated a double fatality and was able to get the case dismissed because they could demonstrate that even though there was a breach of the duty, there was an edge of pavement drop off. That drop off was not a causal element in the crash and in the fatalities that resulted. And again, I'm not saying investigate all crashes, but certain crashes like multiple fatalities, multiple permanent injury, especially if young people are involved, seriously injured, those are the types of consequences or crashes that often lead to tort claims. And then last but not least, care about what you do and be able to demonstrate to a jury or to others that you care about what you do and that you're doing a reasonable job as a road agency professional. And I think by doing maybe some of the things on this list, that's a part of, of showing that you care about what you do. And so I'll wrap up this portion with this slide. Uh, you can tell that's an old sign, but it's, to my knowledge, it's still at this location. But think about that based on what we've talked about for the last three days. The agency is sort of admitting that the intersection has a crash problem or is, is dangerous. And sadly, I still see these signs in my travels around the country. So hopefully none of you have any of these signs that say dangerous or hazardous location. But if you do, think about getting them replaced with the appropriate uh, MUTCD compliant sign. So at this point, I'll stop Victoria and see if there's any questions. And then what we'll do next is start into some of the, uh, the case study examples. Ron, there's no questions in the question box right now. So it looks like it's case study time. Okay, well, let's go into the case studies then. I think I have two today. And we'll look at these from the standpoint of what lessons can we learn from actual tort claims. And I'll try to give you my lessons. You all should feel free to chime in if you feel there were other lessons we could learn from these. Um, I think most of them are motor vehicle crashes, either single or multi-vehicle crashes. But I do have one pedestrian case, and I know pedestrians are a, kind of a hot topic right now across the country, so let's start with the pedestrian case. This is a, uh, occurred on a college campus, or university campus, I should say, but a pedestrian was in the crosswalk 
and was struck by a motor vehicle and she was uh, seriously and permanently injured. She suffered a traumatic brain injury that uh, reduced her abilities and will do so for the rest of her life. So it was a serious crash. These are some of the facts for this case. Uh, it was a female student who was attending the university, and I'll show you some photographs here in a few minutes. It was night, you can see it was about 10 p.m. in November. It was in this part of the country here in the kind of the Northeast or the upper Ohio Valley. Uh, so it was cold, kind of cold, rainy night, not a good night to be out, but she, she and her boyfriend were walking back from class. They had classes on campus and each of them had an apartment in the uh, municipality that adjoined the campus. And so they were walking back to their apartments. And while she was in the crosswalk, she was struck by a vehicle coming from her right, driven by a, a 75 year old male driver. I mentioned she sustained serious injuries and so she filed lawsuits seeking compensation. And really her life was significantly affected. Uh, her colleagues and her professors at the university said that before this crash, she was you know, top of her class, uh, straight A student, actually tutored other students in her major. She was active in community service. So, I mean, she really had a bright future ahead of her. After the crash, uh, her traumatic brain injury was so severe that she was the one that had to be tutored. She'll probably need assistance the rest of her life. I believe she would, can work toward completing her degree at the university, but as I understand it, she's limited to maybe a couple classes a semester rather than the four or five classes a semester she was taking prior to this accident. So the, if you think about sort of the economic loss here of a young person whose career now has been kind of totally derailed, the economic loss there is, is significant. So let me share with you, obviously this is an aerial view, and actually this is before the crash. But let me kind of set the stage here. We can see this road that curves through here. This is a perimeter road that actually serves as the boundary between the university and the municipality. And this, the road I should mention, is the university roadway. So this is the municipality up here, and everything down here is the university. Uh, at the time this photo was taken, you might be able to see it. This is a large parking structure that's being constructed. And as part of this same project, this roadway here, this is a local street, this will be removed. This road will be removed and this will become a green, green space here. And as part of the same project, a road will be put in here which is the exit road from the parking structure. And there will be, I believe it's two left turn, dual left turns and a right turn. So it's a three lane roadway coming out of the, the parking structure. So they're actually sort of flipping the T intersection. This roadway will be gone, but now the stem of the T will be down here. The crosswalk at issue is right here. And notice it's skewed, which is, probably not a good thing. And it's hard to see, but you can see the tip of it there. But there is a sidewalk that runs under those pine trees that connects the campus to the municipality. So that's kind of before. I wanted to give you a little history. This is obviously a daytime aerial view, but this is what it looked like on the night of the crash. Notice the parking structure is complete. Here's the exit roadway from the parking structure. Notice the roadway here is gone. It's just grass now, but notice that sidewalk is still under the pine trees. The crosswalk is still here, and it's hard to see, but this, this is now a signalized intersection. This is signalized, and notice the stop line. And as you're probably maybe asking yourself, why is this crosswalk behind the stop line. And that is at the crux of the, the problem here. So the, the student was coming from campus, walking toward the top of the slide 
when she was struck by a vehicle coming from the right here and struck her as she was in the, the crosswalk. Her allegations were, the complaint that her attorney prepared, alleged that the crosswalk design was defective because it was upstream of the stop line and that that defective design and construction facilitated the crash and the permanent injuries that she sustained. This was going to be one of the plaintiff's trial exhibits and many of you probably recognize this. This is just scanned a couple photographs or images, graphics, if you will, out of the MUTCD. The point being two things. Number one, that the crosswalk really should be at right angles to minimize the pedestrian's crossing time or exposure to traffic, and that the crosswalk should be downstream of the stop line. And this one, this crosswalk violated both of those principles. The plaintiff sued three parties. The consulting engineer firm or the designers that they handled everything. They did the parking structure, the roadway, that the roadway that was removed, uh, the sidewalks, the signal system, they handled everything. Also, the general contractor who built the project, built the roadway and the parking structure. And I don't think I mentioned this university is a state university, so the state was sued as sort of the owner of this project. Of course, the discovery process was pursued or occurred. And these are some of the things, information or evidence that was produced. Of course, photographs, I've shared some of those with you. I'll share some more with you. Original design drawings, I'll share one of those with you. Some marked up drawings during the review process. And I'll share one of those with you that the plaintiff was going to use as a trial exhibit. And then also a variety of deposition testimony. This was one of the design drawings. And just to sort of set the stage, the uh, parking structure is down here. This is the exit roadway here. This is where the road used to be. This is a new sidewalk. You may recall seeing it on the aerial. This is that existing sidewalk that was under the pine trees. Here's the crosswalk, of course. And notice there's a curb ramp on each side of the crosswalk. And then this is the stop line. Unfortunately, this drawing does not show the signal hardware, but there's you know, signal poles and signal heads and things in this area because this is now a signalized intersection. I mentioned that there was a marked up drawing that was shown. This is the marked up drawing, and, and I'll blow that up so you can read it in a minute, but notice there's the original crosswalk, and then someone redlined in here a crosswalk here with a couple curb ramps, and here's what the comment said. This, this is a review comment. It's not clear who made it, but Gary was one of the designers, and says, Gary, if the ramp has not been poured, we would like to move the ramp to the west so we can slide the stop bar a bit back and have the crosswalk in front of the stop bar. The crosswalk would extend straight north and tie into the new proposed sidewalk. And I think would we all agree that that makes sense, right? This still has a little bit of skew, but it's pretty much at right angles and certainly the location of the crosswalk with respect to the stop line is appropriate. One of the key issues in this case from the standpoint of the defendants was that the design firm could never produce a written response by Gary to this comment. And uh, you can probably imagine that is not a good thing. If someone makes a comment in writing, about a design, it deserves a written comment back. Even if the comment is, you know, I've considered your comment and I've looked at this and I've looked at that, I'm not gonna change my design. Even if that's your response, it still deserves a written response. But in this case, there was no written response. Gary was deposed and he claimed, testified in deposition that he responded to this comment, but no one could ever 
produce his comments. So I, you can judge for yourself how how valid that or his testimony was. But here are some photographs. This is obviously a daytime view. This shows you from sort of ground level the perspective of the crosswalk. Witnesses said that the plaintiff was probably what maybe a step or two in front of where this fellow was walking, but basically in the middle of this lane when she was struck by a vehicle coming from the right. It turns out apparently she and her boyfriend were dressed in black clothing. And so that was one of the things that the defendants were bringing up as kind of contributory negligence. That basically they, they were saying it's not prudent to be a pedestrian on a rainy night dressed in black. It's hard for drivers to see you. But of course, the, and, and another, I should say, of course, another uh, defense they made was, you know, if you're dressed in black here at night and the driver is, is a 75 year old male coming towards you, it's really tough for a driver to see someone in black clothing at night, but you should have been able to see the headlamps probably from a couple hundred feet or more away. Why didn't you stop or speed up or start running or something? You had an opportunity to avoid the crash. So those, those were the positions taken by the defendants in terms of trying to attribute some contributory negligence to the plaintiff. This is a daytime view, of course, from the roadway. And notice you can see clearly the signal heads here. You can see the crosswalk. Notice that it is somewhat hard to see the stop line because of, notice there's a little crest in the roadway profile and that stop line is just slightly on the other side of the crest. But notice there, was, there were advanced warning signs. Also notice quite a bit of street lighting. In fact, even at the next intersection, you can see that. In fact, the investigating police officer who was a university employee, since this was a university roadway, she said when she first arrived on the scene, the thing that struck her was how well lit this intersection was. And so she said after she made sure the victim was, you know, the emergency responders were attending to the victim, and after she had controlled traffic at the intersection, she took a photograph to illustrate how well lit the intersection was. And I I, I agree with that. I concur with that. I think photographs and video are a good thing to document the scene and other features. But the next slide I'll show you is her photograph. Does that look like a well-lit intersection? Sadly, it does not. In fact, notice at night in the rain, you can't even see the crosswalk and certainly you cannot see the, uh, the stop line. Uh, and not to criticize her, but if you're taking photographs at night uh, to try to demonstrate what a driver or a pedestrian would see, really we shouldn't be using flash. It should be, the photos should be taken without a flash. And even that, it could be argued, probably don't really replicate the human eye, but certainly a flash photograph at night does not replicate what the human eye sees. So this was a case, it turned out this photo actually was not helpful to the defendants. Actually, the plaintiff adopted this photo and was going to use it at trial. So as you can probably imagine from what I presented, this was not a very good situation for the, the defendants. Uh, there was a confidential out of court settlement reached with all the parties that I estimate to be on the order of about two and a half million dollars. I believe about 1.4 of that, I think, was the design firm. Another one point, maybe one million or so, was the contractor. And then interestingly, in this state, the Tort Claims Act caps awards against state agencies at $100,000. So actually, in this case, the state, which was one of the defendants, they actually offered up their $100,000 very on in the case, just to, early on in the case, just to get out of it. And so they, the total of that is about 2.5 million. I should mention, and this happens quite a bit, 
that the remember one of the defendants was the contractor who built the project before trial the contractor's attorney filed a motion for summary judgment asking that they be dismissed from the case and their argument was your honor we are constructors we build what people tell us to we don't have traffic engineers on our staff to evaluate the traffic engineering or the operational safety or efficiency of these projects therefore we should be dismissed from the case and usually in my experience oftentimes that argument carries weight and the, the judge will dismiss a contractor from the case in this instance though the judge's response was sort of interesting the judge said this crosswalk location is so egregious that you don't need to have a traffic engineering degree to know that that's not where you locate a crosswalk and so he did not dismiss the contractor from the, the suit ron we have a question that came in sure um it says regarding pedestrians the MUTCD, and they put O because Ohio MUTCD, requires a certain amount of flashing don't walk time for ped, for ped signals. When the traffic signal is interconnected to a railroad crossing for preemption, designers sometimes have no choice but to truncate the normal flashing don't walk time when a train approaches in order to clear a queue of cars that may be stopped at the traffic signal and over the tracks. In this case, we are truncating the flashing don't walk signal for a pedestrian legally in the crosswalk in order to clear a vehicle that may be illegally foul of the tracks. Have you heard of any litigation involving this type of operation? Uh, I have not, but I would not be surprised. I mean, you raise a good point. I would not be surprised that there has been such litigation. But I'm, I'm not aware. I don't know if anybody in the audience would have any input on that. I'll send the question out to everybody else too, and they can comment back and I'll share responses. That's okay. all I've got right this minute. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So here, my understanding is if you go to this campus today, this is what you will see. Uh, notice, so this is a subsequent remedial measure or reconstruction. Notice the crosswalk has been moved to where the reviewer who made his comment to get, or her comment to Gary suggested it go but notice if you look closely you can see the uh the old crosswalk there it hasn't been obliterated entirely and notice this sidewalk that was under the trees notice how it has sort of a zigzag design to get the pedestrians to this crosswalk and interestingly there is kind of a rest of the story to this uh i guess about almost a year ago I was teaching, actually teaching this class in a uh, the state DOT, one of their district offices in the same state as where this crash occurred, and I showed this image, and one of the fellows in the back of the room spoke up, and he said, my wife and I were on that campus in August. Our daughter was just starting school there, so we spent the weekend there. You know, taking her things to the residence halls and getting her set up in her room and everything. He said, so I went through that intersection four or five times. He said, do you know where students are crossing the roadway? And interestingly, apparently students are still crossing at this location because that is kind of the shortest distance. And remember, one of the characteristics of humans, pedestrians, is we're energy minimizing creatures. So we want to take the shortest and the flattest route. So my thought were maybe we need to put in a big earth berm here or a fence or some other maybe more attractive mechanism, but something to, to kind of channel or funnel the students to this crossing point rather than allowing them to continue to cross here. So what lessons can we learn from this example? I would say, number one, make sure we follow accepted design practices and criteria and be on the lookout for something like this, where that, clearly that crosswalk was not properly located. As the judge said, it doesn't take a traffic engineer to know that that just wasn't right. Also, I think we can learn the importance of documenting your work, and that there should have been a documented response to that comment to 
Gary. Even if Gary decided, which obviously he did, not to do anything, that comment did deserve a response from Gary. And then finally, you know, don't ignore human behavior. If that's sort of the shortest path crossing distance route for students. We probably need to keep that or factor that into our design and maybe build in some sort of barriers or obstacles to channel them toward the preferred crossing location. So I think that's the end of this example. And I don't know if there's any question. Maybe this is a good stopping point, Victoria, rather than try to just do a few minutes of the, the next case study. We can cover that next time if that works. That would be fine, Ron. I agree with you. This is a good spot for us to stop. Um, I will read off one other comment that came in that I had sent out to the audience. It says, I agree with the problem with design. Since some older people have difficulty seeing at night with rain, additional um, reduced visibility, um, this was mentioned. So I think people are cognizant of that being an issue. Probably a lot more since the retroreflectivity standards came out too. So that's right, exactly. Yeah, good comment. Yeah, and if you let me back up here, and maybe some of you are thinking, even if you didn't type it in the question box, but a question that sometimes comes up when I offer this example is people say, well, why wasn't the driver a defendant? And I, what happened in this case was the uh, driver's insurance company just offered their policy limits pretty quickly and so that the driver in this case was not a party to the to the lawsuit. And, and if you think about it, and no, I don't mean to diminish the driver at all, but if you think about it, what they went after here in this case, the, the plaintiff, being, what the plaintiff went after in this case were the quote deep pockets, the, the design firm and the general contractor, those were the, the deep pockets in this case. So that's all I have today. Thanks for your participation and your good questions. And next time we'll do the, we'll start the road design and maintenance example. And I have some, several other examples we'll go through. And I think next time too, I'll have a couple of them where we'll ask you to participate and play the role of a juror and see how you might allocate responsibility in, in a couple of the cases on Thursday. Sounds great, Ron. We're looking forward to it. Thank you, everybody, for your time today. And thank you, Ron, for the excellent presentation. And we will see everybody on Thursday. Take care. Thank you. See you Thursday. Bye-bye.